Hi, welcome all uh, in our very special discussion today. My name is Santosh and you are watching Workers Unity special talk on international labor. Today we are going to discuss the recent US waves of strikes and current dynamics and situation. And for discussing the same, we have Judy Ankel. Judy retired from UMKC in 17 and after 29 years as a director of the labor studies program, where she especially loved teaching labor history, leadership and mobilization and global economic issues. She spends her retirement still doing labor education for unions and workers' organizations and in community activism and walking with her dog every day. Judy has been an activist all her life and a union activist and organizer in both United States Steel Workers and American Federation of Teachers. She coordinates the Heartland Labor Forum, Labor's Weekly Radio Show in Kansas City on Community Radio KKF1 90.1 FM. Am I right? 90.1 FM. 90.1 FM. KKF1.org. Okay, sure. So she is the founder and president of the Cross Border Network for Justice and Solidarity, a nonprofit organization with a focus on Latin America, which exposes the connection between US imperialism and migration in solidarity with the workers across border. So, Jodi, many, many thanks for joining us. It is really, really a privilege to have you to discuss this all. Well, thank you, Santosh, and it's really a pleasure. I'm, I'm really glad we were connected through our mutual friend, Sarisa. And yeah. um, uh, I, I've never done an interview in India before, uh, so this is a first for me. Uh, we have been following the interest of stick in labor action and the strike in the US. October 21 has been called a strike October. It seems the tight labor market has been working in favor of the strikers. Uh, the strikes have also come in the context of what has been called the Great Resignation, in which 30 million workers have quit their job as a protest against job condition. So this is the context which we are following for last couple of weeks. So could you please explain what is the issues further, what all sectors are going in a strike, what is the current dynamics and situation? Yeah, it's, a, it's actually very complicated. I mean, for 40 years in this country, workers have been losing. Uh, and workers have been forced to give concessions. Workers have been losing rights. Uh, there has been deunionization of the United States. And so uh, I think, you know, at long last, we are beginning to see some real pushback here in this country, certainly exacerbated by the experience with um, COVID and uh, lockdowns and so-called essential workers being forced to put up with working conditions, which were really dangerous to their health. But I also want to put this in context because they, they're calling strike Tober, you know, this really big strike wave. And, you know, when you start from almost zero, anything seems like a lot. But in fact, uh, more workers were on strike in 2018. And, uh, Compared to previous strike waves in this country, this is still really minuscule. We have a long way to go. So I just wanted to put it in that context because I, I, I it's great. You know, people are all excited, uh, people in the labor movement. I don't think the bosses are too excited, but, uh, you know, people in the labor movement are all excited that we're starting to see these, these big strikes. Um, but the biggest one so far is the John Deere strike, which is ongoing which is about 10,000 workers. But in previous, you know, previous eras where both, you know, employers employed more people, particularly in manufacturing, that's a small strike. And, uh, and, and you can understand that when you understand that our Bureau of Labor Statistics is part of our Department of Labor, mm -hmm. only measures and reports statistics of strikes over a thousand workers. So oh. most of these strikes that are going on right now won't even be shown uh, show up in the government statistics uh, oh. because, you know, of, of previous era when strikes were far bigger than they are here, you know, more. Mm -hmm. And I think you can, you know, compared to like strikes in India, yeah. where you have far more workers going on strike than we do. Yes. You know, I mean, we get excited about 25 workers going on strike. <laughs> you know, so so I just wanted to put it in some context. Okay. Um, uh, but anyway, yeah. So yeah, there's 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 a lot of contributing factors which I could talk about. 
Mm -hmm. I mean, there are the uh, there's the fa the factors that U.S. labor law is broken. Uh, we have, frankly, the worst labor law in the developed world, and so uh, and it's been getting worse markedly since 1980, since the era of Ronald Reagan and the beginnings of neoliberal reforms in this country, and uh, and so there's this pen there's pent up grievances, I'd say. That, that we're seeing expressed. Uh, there's been a movement of concessions against workers. Uh, there have been movements to put workers on two, three, four tier, different tiers of pay and benefits. And so um, that all contributes to this. There is an ongoing movement against racism uh, that has impacted the labor movement. Um, and so, so there are a lot of things that are contributing to it. And, okay. and, and the fact is, in the private sector, <coughs> excuse me, only about 6% of workers in the private sector in the United States are unionized. Mm -hmm. The vast majority of workers have no union. You asked about the great res resignation. Mm -hmm. What choice do workers who have no union have if they're really discontent with their working conditions? They vote, for, they vote with their feet, they leave. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, the great resignation applies mostly to workers who have no union. So if you look at it combined, non-union workers leave their workplaces and look for a better job, unionized workers go on strike. I think that's what we're seeing going on here. Okay. So what is the core demand, the kind of charter of demand has been emerging from this strike or this struggle? Like, is it the working conditions or pay wage or social security or more than that? That's a lot of things. I think, you know, um, Cornell University in New York has uh, begun what's called the labor action tracker. Yeah. And they have a map. This reminds me of there was this wonderful strike tracker uh, that was done by China Labor Report in Hong Kong a few years yeah. ago that showed a map of China with all the strikes. So I think they've learned from that and taken it from that. Yes, and yes. They, they are tracking um, strikes in the United States and classifying them by both industry as well as by the primary issue in the strike. And so I looked it up just last night. And so far they have tracked uh, this year since January, I think it's January to the end of October, 889 strikes. And um, the issues involved in those strikes, well, 409 of those strikes uh, were over some form of pay or compensation. And one of the big issues is what's called two tier wages, which I mentioned mm -hmm. earlier. Um, I can give you an example. Uh, I mean, two-tier has been around since the 80s, at least, mm -hmm. where uh, an employer declares or negotiates, forces a union to negotiate that all workers from this point forward will make less money or all workers will ha not have a pension mm -hmm. or health, uh, different health care even different vacation and time off and stuff like that. So I went to work in a factory in 1978 uh, where they had just instituted two tier. And everybody who was hired in my group and after made 70 cents less an hour mm -hmm. for working the same job. So there you are. Excuse me, I have to take a drink. <laughs> Sure. No. So there you are working next to somebody doing the same work, expected to produce the same productivity, and you're making less money. And in those days, 70 cents an hour, we were making about $10 an hour. So 70 cents was a lot. Yeah. And, you know, employers loved it. Workers hated it, and it created tremendous divisions within the workforce. You know, the new people 
looked at the older people and we said, why did you sell us out? Mm -hmm. Why should we support your pension when we don't get one? You know? Yeah. Yeah. And so it, it, you know, it's brilliant from the point of view of the employer, yeah. but it, it's, um, you know, it's really terrible for union solidarity. And, you know, in our, my union president understood that we made it a, pro, a, a priority in the next negotiations and we got rid of it, but it's become much more stubborn. Mm -hmm. And every time the economy goes, looks like it's going bad, employers start negotiating concessions. And one of the favorite concessions is, is two tier, what's called two tier. With the Don, John Deere workers in 1997, they were forced to accept a two tier system which eliminated the pension uh, mm -hmm. and the type of pension was called a defined benefit pension where you know you knew how much you were gonna get when you retired and it was up to the employer to make sure that they invested the money and were able to give the return to the workers of a certain amount of money. Mm -hmm. uh, and they replaced it with uh, something called an IRA, which is where the amount you're gonna get depends on how you invest the money. So there's no guaranteed income in your pension. Uh, and you know, if the if stock market goes down or up, you know, it, it will make a difference in how much you make. Mm -hmm. So that was 1997. So that, you know, so it's now, uh, what, 24 years since then, 25 years. Mm -hmm. And the workers who were hired after 1997 are now becoming the senior workers at John Deere. And they're saying, this really, this is unacceptable that we're not gonna have decent pensions. And then John Deere came to them in negotiations and said, oh, we wanna eliminate the pension program. So the new hires, a third mm -hmm. tier would get much less. And yeah, and they, real, and they realized, you know, one, it was divisive to the union, but two, it was systematically lowering the benefits of workers over a period of time. And so that's a big issue in that strike right now is they, you know, the workers said enough is enough. We all need to make the same and get the same benefits. So that's a primary cause mm -hmm. of, of, uh, in not just that strike, but in, in a number of strikes where workers are really fed up with this two tier system. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, I mean, another, I think, I think COVID make it made a huge difference. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, so many of the people that are on strike right now are, um, are people who were quote, essential workers last year, you know, and they've gone from being essential workers. Oh, heroes. We called them heroes. Yeah. You know, they were on the front line of COVID, you know, and, and the same story everywhere. Yeah, meatpacking workers and, and grocery store workers and delivery people and all of those people were uh, were honored and you know told how how good they were. Meanwhile, the corporations they worked for were making money hand over fist. And then they come into negotiations and they don't want to share that. In fact, some of them are asking for take backs. And these workers who are overworked and Please. underpaid mm -hmm. said enough is enough. Uh, an example of that was the Frito-Lay strike in uh, right near where I live in Topeka, Kansas. It was in several locations, but that was one of the large ones. Frito-Lay makes uh, chips, you know, mm -hmm. uh, uh, Fritos. <laughs> I don't know if mm -hmm. you have them in India, but you know, corn chips. And okay. uh, yeah, and uh, it was a large plant. I don't remember how many. And I went out to that strike line and talked and interviewed the workers. And you know, the workers tell, tell me that many of them had been working a hundred days straight without a day off. That they would have what you know, they they had these death shifts where you would work 12 hours, go mm -hmm. home and have to show up eight hours later for a next, for oh. next shift. Mm -hmm. You know. So they were exhausted, their families were alienated, they never saw their kids, mm -hmm. and it was unsafe. You know, oh, they had a worker who died on the way home because he fell asleep in his car. And, and so, um, you know, they finally got to the breaking point. Okay. And, yeah, and, and, and they absolutely wanted a change in the way the company did scheduling. And, 
so that they didn't have to work so many hours. And, you know, and many of them, you know, many of these corporations think, you know, you live to work and the mm -hmm. workers are saying, no, you, we, we work to live. And that's all. And don't expect us to devote our entire lives to your profits. And so, so we're seeing that in a number of these strikes. Um, we're seeing protest. <clears throat> excuse me. We're seeing protests against um, health and safety issues in the plant. I'm on the board of a uh, a meat packing plant, Smithfield. Uh, okay. pork plant mm -hmm. in Milan, Missouri. I'm on the board of the Worker Center, which it's a non-union plant. Uh, mm -hmm. The workers are uh, overwhelmingly immigrants um, from Latin America and Africa. Uh, the workers speak basically two different languages, Spanish and French. And there's a lot of trouble, you know, for the workers getting together and understanding mm -hmm. one another. Um, but at the beginning of COVID, you know, the plant did virtually nothing to protect the workers. And uh, it was big news in the United States, another Smithfield plant, which was in South Dakota, where a number mm -hmm. of workers contracted the disease and died. And the government, this was the Trump administration, the government did virtually nothing to protect those workers. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, and so the workers in this particular plant in Missouri uh, were working way too close together. They had no shields, they had no masks, they had no protective equipment. There was nothing about, um, you know, like in the company cafeteria, making people sit a distance away. And, and so, you know, like it was very, very dangerous. And, and what those mm -hmm. workers did since they didn't have a union was um, they, they actually sued the company as, uh, for creating a public nuisance, um, mm -hmm. which they lost, but it put the company on attention and they did start to provide some protective equipment and do mm -hmm. some spacing of people away. Um, there have been a number of COVID actions among both unionized and non-union workers in this country that have also provoked militancy, I'd say, among workers. Another huge issue, and it's related to the overtime issue, is staffing, um, because yes. so many of these places are short-staffed. And they refuse over the years. Um, <laughs> the way I think of it is they, um, Employers not only converted to, do you know what just in time inventory systems are? Okay. Yeah, yes, Part yes, of the yes, global yes. supply no. chain. Yes. yes. Well, they also uh, decided on just in time staffing, I'd say. And so th this has meant that um, they have, you know, increasingly used contract labor and mm -hmm. temporary labor. Mm -hmm. I think this is a problem in India too, as yeah, well. Yes. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Big problem with exactly. temps. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, and so, but, you know, they, uh, uh, the whole concept of lean production has been that you use as few people as possible. Uh, it, you know, this can be deadly in yes. both manufacturing as well as, you know, we've seen it a lot in healthcare, mm -hmm. where hospitals are under, dreadfully understaffed. Mm -hmm. And not only does it mean that you work lots of overtime, and you know weekends and all of that kind of stuff, mm -hmm. but it also means that the work itself becomes much more dangerous. Obviously, yeah. And so and so we've we've seen a lot of strikes and a lot of actions on job actions on staffing as well. Those are some of the major. Uh, let me let me see if there's other ones. Uh, I have this whole list here. No. Yes. Please. Um, I'd say those are some of the, the major reasons why workers are striking. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know if that answers your question or not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No. So uh, when we are discussing here in India with our friend, so one of the questions they keep asking me, uh, how much spontaneity is there in these strikes and why have unions buckled under pressure from corporates even under a tight labor market? So is it very spontaneous or you can see some kind of organized uh, protest also. I'm sorry, can you repeat that? So how much spontaneity is there in these strikes? Is it very spontaneous, erupted just oh, to knee-jack reaction or there is some kind of organization? It's, it's a mix. 
I mean, many okay. of the districts, if you understand labor law here, um, workers, unions, almost all unions include what's called no strike clauses, which mm -hmm. means that you pledge when you sign that union, that collective bargaining agreement, you pledge mm -hmm. that you will not strike of, uh, for the duration of the agreement. And if you do strike, there are some pretty terrible penalties uh, that mm -hmm. go against the union. The union can be found liable for all the lost production, for instance. So um, most strikes in this country are uh, what's called, uh, well, uh, are strikes that occur after a contract expires. Okay. Um, and co contracts typically go from three to five to even six years. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so most strikes then are over Nego what's being negotiated for the next contract. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and so, you know, it's rare that you see a, a spontaneous strikes that are not mm -hmm. at when a contract has expired. It's pretty rare. Uh, unions are tasked with disciplining the workers not to do that. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that's okay. good. That's just the way yeah. the system is. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, <clears throat> These strikes that we've been seeing are strikes primarily that are when the contract is expires, negotiations have come to a, a halt or what's called impasse. And they um, and then so the union usually calls the strike. But you know, there there are times when the members are demanding it. Mm -hmm. And the union basically has to go along. Excuse me for a sec. You're going to edit this, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll edit it. Um, I don't know what's wrong with my voice today. It's winter here. It's starting winter. Yeah. I... And uh, it's getting very dry. So so what we have seen a lot of right recently is mm -hmm. that the union leadership and the company come to an agreement on a contract mm -hmm. and then they have to put it by in almost every union they have mm -hmm. to put it to a vote of the members mm -hmm. and what we are seeing is the members are voting it down voting the offer down and then they go on strike or they're on strike and they come to them with another negotiated settlement. This is what we just saw in the um, John Deere strike mm -hmm. where the company, okay, the company was pushed to negotiate a better deal after the workers went on strike. And so they came up with a better deal. The union actually recommended it Mm -hmm. to the members, the members voted it down and remained on strike and told their leadership to go back to the bargaining table and get a better deal. So we're seeing that kind of pushback against the leadership. There was just a case in uh, the state of Washington where mm -hmm. the carpenters there okay. actually went on, I believe it was a wildcat strike, demanding that they get uh, 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 improvements and I'm not familiar with the details in that, but it was seen as a major pushback against the leadership of, of the Carpenters Union. Okay. So, so, um, so it's a mixed, I'd say it's, it's, it's mixed in terms of, you know, how much of this is spontaneous rank and file activity and how much of this is, you know, like supported okay. by the union leadership. Yeah, okay. So related to this, uh, some of my friends are asking, is the class politics, quote into quote, class politics is back into the US politics or US discourse? Is the labor again back in discourse? Do you see labor in the US fighting back the anti labor regime assert in the wake of, especially after defeat of the Patco strike of 1981? So I think, so, so their main question from you is, is the, there are fundamental shift in the kind of radical politics, quote in quote, what we see here? Nah. <laughs> <laughs> um, radical politics? Is that what you're asking? So, 
So we are, uh, is there any tendency to go towards that direction? Any uh, weak tendency? You mean, when, is the labor movement moving to the left? Is that what you're asking? Yeah. Yeah. Not clear. Um, you know, I think so much of what, what, what we're seeing is, is, you know, being fed up, mm -hmm. um, you know, saying oh, we're not going to take it anymore. Mm -hmm. um, I think for a number of people who were, you know, so stressed, I mean, we're, these strikes are among people who continue to work during COVID mm -hmm. primarily. Yes. And, and, and so they're saying, you know, you called us heroes. Now you're treating us like, you know, crap. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and, you know, we want our just what, what we've earned. We want you to treat us with respect and you're not. And you have made so much money. You have piled it up during the uh, during COVID. And enough is enough. Okay. I don't mm -hmm. think it's really indicating much greater class consciousness than that would imply. Okay. Uh, I you know I'm not seeing. Uh, I mean, you see the word capitalism thrown around. Yes. But I'm not seeing any kind of systematic critiques of the system. I mean, people say, oh, yeah, maybe I, maybe we should have socialism, but they don't even know what socialism is, by and large. Yeah. And, and so, yeah, uh, there's a long way to go in this country yeah. to, to yeah. achieve any kind of major change. Uh, I mean, it's, it's still clear that the super rich are in the driver's seat. And, okay. uh, you know, it, that's clear in the politics in Washington. Mm -hmm. uh, and the problem, Joe Biden, who is by no means a big reformer, yes. uh, even having getting his modest agenda through through Congress, um, you know, the people who drive politics in this country are the super rich, the billionaires, and they're still in the driver's seat. So when Biden says decline of union density has weakened the U.S. democracy, this kind this is kind of big statement. So how you will read this? How what is that? kind of signal he was trying to give. I'm sorry, I didn't really understand. So I have I have read somewhere, Biden have said, Joy Biden, Biden, decline of union density has weakened the US democracy. This is the statement coming oh, from the US president. Oh, decline of US, yes. Yeah. Um, oh, well, that's clear. You know, <laughs> I mean, the Demo he's a Democrat. He's in the Democratic Party. And yes. the Democratic Party for years and years depended on the labor movement to get out the vote. Um, I mean, they depended on labor union contributions, but mm -hmm. primarily they depended on labor unions mobilizing people to vote for them. And the decline of union density has certainly been a problem for the, for, for the Democratic Party. But you know, we, we saw decades ago now, um, with Bill Clinton in, in the 1990s, we saw the Democratic Party understand that they could no longer depend on unions and union dollars. And so that's when the Democratic Party became neoliberal. And that's when the Democratic Party went to Wall Street for their sustenance. And mm -hmm. that still exists. So yeah, Joe Biden can talk about how <clears throat> they're, they're, we they're weakened and they are. <laughs> They're weakened because, you know, like money doesn't vote in elections, you know, people do. And they've got they've got to appeal to the people, but they're but they're stuck because they have this two headed monster that they've created now, you know, with the Wall Street, the Bloombergs and the people like that who who, you know, want want to protect their financial interests in the banks and and mm -hmm. want deregulation mm -hmm. and do not do not want to pay high wages. Mm -hmm. And then you've got the workers they're trying to appeal to, uh, appeal to who have very contradictory interests. And the Democratic Party is really, you know, it, it's got a split personality. And so uh -huh. Biden may say that out of one side of his mouth, but on the other side of the mouth, his mouth, he's, he's talking to his patrons who are saying, don't do this or do this. So, uh, you know, uh, it's a two-headed monster. Yeah, okay. So sure, yeah, so I have two couple of uh, small questions. So how the civil society is reacting? How the mainstream politics, journalists, student, 
how they are reacting to this kind of new development, if you can say, because you have already contextualizing, this is not a very big, big shift. So how, what is the mood in the, in the general public discourse? Seems to be a lot of support. I mean, I, you know, the popularity of labor unions has really gone up in the last few years. Mm -hmm. I mean, something like 67%, I think it is, of workers, are, uh, of, I think working people are now saying they'd join a union if they could. The, the mm -hmm. trouble is it's almost impossible to join a union or to organize mm -hmm. a union in, in a workplace. Mm -hmm. We saw that in the Amazon organizing attempt in Birmingham, Alabama earlier this year. Um, we're seeing it in the attempt of Starbucks workers to organize in Buffalo, New York, where, I mean, this is just phenomenal. Um, Starbucks, which is based in Seattle, is flying executives in suits to Buffalo to occupy Starbucks stores. Uh, you know, three, you show up to work and, you know, in this little store, you know, which is selling coffee. And um, there's three executives there sweeping the floor, cleaning the toilets, trying to be your friend and say, mm -hmm. you know, we, we care about you. And mm -hmm. meanwhile, they're all over the place and you can't talk to the workers, your fellow workers who might be, you know, undecided about whether or not to vote for the union uh, because these guys are listening in. This is a union busing tactic that, that Starbucks has invented which seems mm -hmm. to be pretty effective. We'll see what happens when the Starbucks workers vote on their union. But union busting is just a huge industry here. Mm -hmm. And it, it's so hard for people to organize, but people, the general public in, uh, is, is definitely supporting these strikes. You know, and, and you saw it like uh, out of Frito-Lay when I was there one afternoon interviewing workers, um, mm -hmm. As they were on strike on, you know, they had a tent and they had tables with food and canned goods they were distributing. People were showing up and just donating stuff. You know, letters the editor are showing them. People, people understand, you know, the working class uh -huh. understands. That okay, so, so related to this, the infamous AFL-CIO, which has been the part of the corporation, and have also been the party to the police politics of the US state. So do you think any changes in that kind of the whole structure, people are moving more towards the more autonomous workers led organization? You know, I had a friend uh, from Peru who came here and, and he, he consistently called the AFL-CIO the AFL-CIA. Um, so <laughs> they, didn't have a re they, they certainly didn't have a good reputation in those that was in the 90s in those days in Latin America and in many places they still don't but it has changed and I wouldn't call them that now um, but you know I have to say that the FLCIO uh, people you know think it's like the general confederation of, of trade unions and it has some kind of power the FLCIO has very limited power. It's a, it's a confederation of unions that can't call workers out on strike mm -hmm. and has a political arm which goes and lobbies for bills in, in, in state legislatures and in Washington, DC, but it can't then turn around and say, okay, let's have a general strike. Mm -hmm. They don't have that kind of power. Um, they are beholden to the most conservative wings of the labor movement, which are generally the construction unions, mm -hmm. who are working a lot now. Ever since COVID was over, there's been a tremendous burst of building, and there's going to be even more with the new infrastructure bill that was just passed. And mm -hmm. so the construction unions are going to be pretty fat and happy. And uh, they're, they're a drag on, you know, like the militancy of, of, of the labor movement in this country. Um, but I, I do think that the leadership of the AFL-CIO has woken up to the fact that they have to be much stronger in terms of being kind of uh, leaders in uh, moral leaders mm -hmm. of, of the working class and advocate much more for unorganized workers, for workers of color, for women workers. And they are, they are beginning to fill that role more. So I'm, I'm optimistic. Okay. But I also understand that they have very limited power. Okay. Yeah. So I have one last question. Okay. 
So pandemic have accelerated this inequality process in all together a different scale. We have seen how much the people are saying the capitalism have restructured themselves during the pandemic. So how as a labor historian, as a labor researcher, you have someone who has been engaged with the labor for quite some time, do you think any possibility the working class politics will restructure also along the similar line? They have to do something and what is the future you are seeing? That's a really difficult question. Um, you know, I've always thought, I've done a lot of international work, um, particularly in Latin America. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, there's much greater class consciousness outside of the United States than inside the United States. I mean, this is the belly of the monster in terms of capitalism is concerned. Now that may be changing, but it, you know, it, it still is. And it's probably gonna be the last place to change. Uh, you know, we in the United States, I think workers in the United States, even though many of them don't understand this, are really dependent on the, on the fight back of workers in other countries uh, to show us the way. But uh, that's, that said, I mean, we are seeing significant political changes in this country. I mean, the campaign of Bernie Sanders who calls himself a socialist, but is hardly a socialist, Mm -hmm. uh, was very, very popular among many sectors in the working class. Mm -hmm. And, it, you know, it may, his campaign makes think people think, uh, think bigger, think that there are more possibilities, you know, think that, quote, another world is possible. And, and so I think that is registering some change, but I don't mm -hmm. think we're seeing it yet in terms of the structure of our parties. And that's going to be, uh, I'm not sure how that's going to come because the Democrats are probably going to lose control of the Congress in the next elections. And then it's going to be, you know, resistance, resistance, you know, circle the wagons, uh, kind of, that's a very American term, I guess. Uh, yeah. you know, um, and, uh, uh, you know, and, uh, and, and just defend ourselves. I mean, there has been very, very, it's basically since the dawn of neoliberalism, there has been mm -hmm. very, very little progress made in the proactive sense of winning things for workers. We've, we've been on the defensive so much that that's, that's still a mode that I think is, is dominant. Okay. And so so I hate to be, I'm sorry to be so, you know, like pessimistic. I'm not so pessimistic as I am, you know, like realistic about where this country is at. Yeah. Yeah. So, 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 so la the last thing. So, could you please tell me what is the mood in the educational campus, the university? Is the student are getting concerned with the working class politics, working class strikes? They are going su to support somewhere, or mm -hmm. they are reading the Marxist stuff, or something like that? In my say, well, first off, I've been retired for three years, so I'm not really in a position to talk about what the mood is. I could only talk about what the mood was and. Um, not, <laughs> I, I, I'd rather not say. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Judy. It was really, really nice to talking to you. So Yeah, well, keep... I hope this was useful to you and understandable. Yeah. Um, okay. And, and thank you. Thank you for the thank interview. You.